This is uh, my talk entitled When Geek Leaks, and this is going to require some explanation as to exactly what this talk is about. When you look at the word geek in the dictionary, you can find several different definitions. One is a carnival performer who bites the heads off live chickens. Uh, that's not the kind of geek I'm going to be talking about today. Another dictionary definition for geek is a computer expert or enthusiast which is often considered offensive when used by outsiders. And I'm not sure why the dictionary says that. I take some offense at the dictionary calling me offensive uh, when someone calls me a geek. I don't think that's quite true. Uh, another definition from the dictionary is a particular or otherwise dislikable person, particularly one who is overly intellectual. I also take exception to that definition of geek from the dictionary. But the one that I'm going to use is a kind of more common usage, and that's using geek as a verb. And that is to spend enormous amounts of time immersed in some sort of activity that other people are not interested in at all. And a lot of you do this all the time. You have hobbies or professions or something that you spend a crazy amount of time on and other people can't figure out why you like it so much. That's what is frequently called geeking out on a topic, and that's the version of geek that I'm going to use here. In fact, this idea of when geek leaks is really this idea of taking an area where you have a tremendous amount of passion, but not about technology, but applying that technology, uh, applying that passion to the solutions that you use for technology. Very often on software projects, we become very tunnel vision around things like technology choices and we forget about things like sociology and psychology and other things that actually make our lives much better but we ignore them because they're not in our kind of core area of expertise but if we pay attention to geeks from those realms we can make things a lot better. And let me give you an example of this. Now my role on software projects tends to be very much a technical kind of tech lead architect kind of person and so I'm a systematizer. Every time I look at a problem, I try to uh, categorize it and characterize it and put it in hierarchies, and it drives my wife crazy. Let me give you an example of exactly the kind of thing that happens in my life. So you go to McDonald's, and you look up on the little board up above the counter, and you go, oh, that's a Big Mac. Okay, that looks pretty good. I think I'll take one of those. Number one, please. But then when you get it back to your table, it actually looks a lot more like this. <laughs> And so I was remarking on this phenomenon to my wife, and I said, there's a very easy explanation for this. The picture is the class, and what we have is an instantiation of the class. <laughs> and apparently there's some sort of exception that happened along the way. This, I think, is a brilliant observation, but when I say this to my wife, she rolls her eyes at me. And so I basically built this keynote so I can talk about this kind of stuff to people who won't roll their eyes at me when I make these kind of observations. <laughs> The other thing I want to talk about in this keynote, this idea of geek leaking, is a really, really famous character who in many ways exemplifies this idea. His name is Richard Feynman. He was a Nobel Prize winning physicist in the U.S. back in the middle of the last century. Uh, he was a remarkable intellectual a giant. He had this characteristic called synesthesia, they believe where he could actually have a separate sense about, math, about mathematics. One of the things that Feynman did as a child was spend a lot of times in math competitions. They had in high schools, they would have like a math bowl where all these students would get together, they would give them really hard math problems and see which school could come up with better solutions for them. And Richard Feynman was brilliant at this competition. And in fact, throughout his life, he could glance at an equation, even if it's something he wasn't familiar with, and say, man, that doesn't look right. He couldn't do exactly what was wrong with it, but it just didn't look right. It was unbalanced or something. So he had a special scent about mathematics and equations. And it's telling that for Mr. Feynman, the first few books that were written about him were not actually biographies, but stories about him. Because the other thing he was brilliant about <coughs> is the ability to tell stories about himself. And he had a long set of very, very well told stories. One of the stories he tells so when he was a child, this is back in the 1940s in the U.S., but I'm sorry, 1920s in the U.S., <clears throat> one of the things that he did was he learned how radios worked. And so he would go to neighbors' houses and 
help, help them fix their radios if some problem was happening. And he went to one of his neighbor's houses, and the radio, when they turned it on, it would make this horrible buzzing noise for like 30 seconds, and then the radio would play clearly. And so he sat and thought about it for a while, and he realized, oh, there must be a bad tube, and when it warms up, it works, but until it warms up, you get the static. So he replaced the tube. <coughs> Excuse me. His neighbors couldn't stop talking about the boy who fixes radios by thinking about them. His, his uh, neighbors were just stunned that he could fix it by just thinking about it and then coming up with a solution without having to actually monkey around inside it. Uh, Feynman uh, gave us some fundamental discoveries in physics. He was one of the first uh, creators of this idea of quantum mechanics. In fact, this is a Feynman diagram for quantum mechanics. It's a well-known technique in the physics world. He was also um, very eccentric. And they said that it was actually quite good that Feynman won the Nobel Prize early in his life because if you act the way that he did and you're not a Nobel Prize winner, you're just this weird person. But if you're a Nobel Prize winner and you act that way, you're eccentric, and that's okay. You get a Nobel Prize. And so he did a lot of very eccentric things throughout his career, <coughs> some of which I'll talk about through this talk. He was also famous for solving other people's problems. And this is where part of his geek leak aspects come in. Throughout his career, people from other scientific disciplines would bring him problems. And many times, he would come up with innovative solutions to them because he could think outside the box because he wasn't in their field. But he was smart enough to be able to put together interesting connections that gave them insights into their own field. In fact, Feynman was involved in what has got to be the biggest example of geek leak in history because they turned this innocuous formula into the most destructive force on the planet. He also worked in the atomic bomb project, and several interesting anecdotes come from his work on that project. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so here's another example from the real world of geek leaks. About a year ago, a Forbes released an article saying that now every company is a software company. Their point is an important one because their point here is that if you're Delta Airlines and you don't have a first class web application and a first class iPad app and a first class iPhone app, then you're not going to do well against your competitors, the other airlines, because you're you don't have as good a presence out in the world as they do. So every company has to become a software company. Competence in software becomes a really important core competency for every company. But notice this is just a great example of geek leaking. This is the software world now leaking into the business world. And we've long predicted that this is going to happen and become more of a first class citizen. It's really happening now. Because every company has to demonstrate competence in software detail. <coughs> Another example of this idea of geek leaks actually comes from my most recent book. Last year I published a book called Presentation Patterns. And it's actually a very unusual book for me. All of my previous books have been hardcore technical topics like uh, web development and productivity as a programmer. This is actually a book about doing presentations like this, doing technical presentations. And it's really a combination of several concepts. It is the design patterns concept plus books like Presentations Then and Spideology. But we really liked design patterns. As I said, I'm kind of an architect and geek by nature. So I like very concrete things like design patterns. That's what I didn't like about the books like Presentations In and Slideology is that while conceptually they're very good books, they're very kind of hand wavy and not very concrete. So we wanted, we like very concrete things because we're technologists. We really like <coughs> the idea of patterns. We thought about creating it as a recipe book. But the problem is that's at the slight wrong level of abstraction. Because if you look at a recipe like this, this is a recipe of how, to, of how to create a very specific kind of dish. This is not the kind of advice that we're trying to give. We're actually trying to give you advice about these things that you have to know to make recipes work, like what saute means, what simmer means, 
and what season to taste means. Those are the kind of building blocks we're trying to provide with our presentation pattern. So we're not trying to tell you how to put together a sales pitch or a technical presentation or a keynote. We're giving the building blocks that you can put together to build your own stuff. The other reason we wanted to go with the patterns concept is because we wanted to specifically call out some presentation anti-patterns. Because this is one of those cases where the tools that you're provided actually encourage you to do horrible, horrible things. Most of the defaults in every presentation tool out there lead to really terrible presentations. And so we wanted anti-patterns because we wanted to call out things that you shouldn't be doing as well as things you should be doing. And let me give you an example of that. So I started doing conference presentations back in the, the mid-90s. And over time, I got better and better at it as I did more and more talks. And I finally reached a point in about 2007 where this is one of my slides. And notice that I had gone and created a nice custom background, and I was using Keynote, and I was using the state-of-the-art 3D bullets with reflection, you'll notice, in Keynote. <laughs> and I was doing a technical talk at a conference, and I got an evaluation form back that said, really love the technical content, but really old-fashioned presentation style. I said, old-fashioned presentation style, did you notice I used the gold 3D bullets <laughs> on my slide? I mean, what could be more cutting edge than the 3D bullets with reflection on the slide? But this made me start really thinking about what is this as a communication medium? It forced me to rethink the way that I do things. We now call this out an anti-pattern called a bullet riddle corpse. Because the problem here is that when you bring up a slide like this, Every single person in the room has to read the entire thing. You can't stop yourself from reading the entire thing. So me bringing up a slide full of bullet text is useless because you're not going to pay attention to me for the next 30 seconds because you're going to be reading that, and now you have to sit through the next five minutes of me reading it to you. That's a horrible, horrible experience. Another one of the anti-patterns we call out, this is actually one of my title slides from a talk I did in 2002. Uh, which we call flood marks, which are like water marks, but there's so many of them, it's like a flood. A lot of conferences try to get you to use their templates with all this extra stuff around them. And so in 2002, I got defensive and started adding my own ugly crap to slides. Because I figured if the conference is going to add a bunch of ugly stuff, I'm going to add some of my own ugly stuff to it for every single slide. Of course, this is doing no good whatsoever for getting information across, and we now call all those things out as anti -passes. <coughs> You've probably seen a lot of slides like this. This is useless as a slide. It's a bullet real corpse. It has these flood marks on it. And particularly, these little logos and things like that, this little swoopy thing at the top, that's a absolute poison if it's on every slide. Because here's the problem you're going to run into. I want to put a picture that covers the entire slide. What do I do about the stupid swoopy thing? Do I cover up the swoopy thing and make this slide not like the others? Or do I make the, the picture smaller so that the swoopy thing is still there and now I've got a bunch of white space around it that shouldn't show up? Do I really need to beat you over the head with what company I work for on every single slide that I show you? I don't think that's very useful. It's okay for the first and last slides to have those kind of company identifiers, but beating people to death with them is not helping things. So we're trying to get rid of all this uh, numbing, repetitive noise. So those are all anti-patterns. But the entire book's not anti-patterns. In fact, it's mostly patterns. So let me give you an example of a pattern. One that we call context keeper. One of the problems you have as you're walking and going through a presentation like this is making sure that you have the, the context established for every slide. So I want to show you a snippet from one of the talks that I'm actually going to do here later this week for my technology radar talk. And what I'm talking about here are litmus tests where you're trying to choose a new technology. And I have these litmus strips that I have to kind of carry that idea. And the idea of a context keeper is that for every one of these slides that is a litmus test, I'm going to have those litmus papers show up somewhere. I'm using this feature in Keynote called Magic Move that automatically moves them from place to place for me. I do the placement, but it does the animation for me. So I can keep talking about these litmus tests, and you know that I'm still talking about litmus tests because I have that little identifier on the screen carrying that context for me. So if you look at all these slides in sequence, you'll see that that little litmus test guy shows up in each one of them, reinforcing the idea that we're still talking about these litmus tests. 
This slide may in fact look familiar because I had a slide almost exactly like this a little bit earlier. And this is actually another technique that we talk about called backtracking. Very often you'll go into a topic and kind of digress a bit and then want to come back to your main topic. That's exactly what I'm doing here. Started talking about context keepers and then came back ultimately to context keeper here. That keeps the agenda firmly in people's mind without having to put a bulleted list up there of agenda of where we are. These are very subtle ways of letting people know where we are within a presentation. You will probably notice that a few times during my presentation, there doesn't seem to be anything showing at all. And if you go to the speaker training groups like Toastmasters or SlideWrite uh, or SpeakerWrite, they will tell you, you shouldn't use presentation software at all because it distracts from you as the speaker. I say that's incorrect. You should use presentation software, but when you want the focus to come back to you, just put a blank slide up. Then there's nothing else to look at but me. So you have to come back to me when there's nothing else interesting to look at. So I purposely put blank slides in my presentation when I want to make a point, when I want you to look back at me and not be distracted by all my imagery, I put a blank slide. This is a pattern that we call invisibility. We're trying to get rid of the stale content. The presence of this book shows that, in fact, I try everywhere I can in the world to systematize and try to put things in hierarchies. In fact, if you looked closely at my title slide for this talk, you'll notice that, uh, in fact, Lucia mentioned this, one of my titles at ThoughtWorks is a meme wrangler, which is a made-up title. ThoughtWorks allows you to create your own titles. And I basically came up with this. My first title at ThoughtWorks was Software Architect, which is a pretty good reflection of the job that I was doing at the time. But then I realized in the U.S. that very often Software Architect means post-useful that you spend more time in Visio and at whiteboards than you do writing code. So I wanted to get away from that, and I picked a much more abstract title of Meme Wrangler, which has kind of become more true over time. Uh, this is a, a concept that Richard Dawkins came up with. A meme is a viral unit of thought. So a meme is to a gene, or a meme is kind of like uh, to thought as a gene is to DNA. It's these little viral units of thought that you can pass from one brain to another just like a virus passes from one brain to another. And in fact, that's a lot of what I end up doing, this, this kind of synthesis of ideas. Uh, here's another example of Geek Leaks. This is from a fascinating book called What the Doormat Saw, how the 60s counterculture shaped the personal computing industry. And it's a great example of this idea of Geek Leaking. Because we kind of assume that the personal computer was a foregone conclusion. It seems so obvious now what a useful thing this is. But back in the 1940s and 50s, that was not a common view at all. Computers were these industrial strength things that only companies cared for. Watson of IBM very famously said that the world only needs five or six computers because they're these big industrial strength things. He wasn't thinking about computers like this. And in fact, it was the 60s counterculture guys who were really interested in the democratization of power and, and computing ability that really started talking about this idea of a personal computer and a computer that a single person might use, which is a crazy concept at that time. They founded a group of intellectuals at Sale. This is John McCarthy. Some of you will recognize him as the father of Lisp. Uh, the creator or discoverer of LISP. He ran SAIL, which is the, the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Um, they did a lot of artificial intelligence. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that LISP is very closely associated with artificial intelligence. In fact, a lot of people believe that LISP is a language primarily designed for AI. That's not true at all. LISP is a perfectly good general purpose programming language. But what happened was the guys who created LISP very quickly got into the AI space, and it was the most powerful language to, to do that style of programming, so it became associated with uh, artificial intelligence as one of its very early applications. But these guys did a lot of real deep innovation. These guys helped form the ideas that Xerox Park later created into MICE and Ethernet. There's a famous demo. This is a, a reunion of these guys back in the 1980s. <coughs> There's a famous event called the Mother of All Demos. This is back in the 1950s where they, they actually demonstrated live, and there's video of this, 
of a, a mouse and Ethernet and network connection and bitmap displays and all the stuff that we now take for granted is very, very cutting edge stuff back at the time. Most of these guys were heavily involved in the uh, counterculture in the 1960s on the West Coast. San Francisco was kind of the, the core of the anti-war counterculture. In fact, they're pretty sure that the very first e-commerce transaction to ever take place on the internet was probably a drug deal between these guys. There's pretty good evidence that that's what they were using the internet for in the early days. It's not really e-commerce because it was barter, so it's hard to say it was the first e-commerce transaction, but we're pretty sure that the first thing that was traded electronically was probably illegal drugs. But there are interesting implications to that. So one of the ways that I misspent my youth is something that used to be popular in the U.S. about 20 or 30 years ago, which is the prank phone call. You call up some establishment, ask them if they have Prince Albert in a can, and then tell them you should let him go or something like that. Uh, used to, you could make prank phone calls. You could sit around late at night and dial random numbers and say silly things and laugh at them. But that doesn't exist anymore. Nobody makes prank calls anymore. Why is that? Well, it's because phones don't look like this anymore. They look like this. And all of these have caller ID on them. And it sucks to make a prank phone call and then have the person you're pranking call you right back and say, stop it. It takes all the fun out of it. And so nobody does this anymore as an activity. Just as a kind of aside, a friend of mine recently, his, uh, a babysitter came to his house and said, Mr. Hunt, why is your phone connected to the wall? Are you afraid someone's going to try to steal it? <laughs> but this is actually a great example of geek leaks because why do we have spam email? The reason we have spam email is because email doesn't have caller ID. There's no reliable way to find out who actually sent you this thing, enabling this entirety of spam. Why does spam exist? Because the 60 counterculture guys who created email didn't see a need for caller ID because they all knew each other. They were all hippies. They didn't want the ability to track somebody down. They wanted democratization, democratization of information. They wanted to be wide open. And the side effect of that now is that we have to deal with spam and spam filters and all that sort of stuff. But that's because of that very early influence by these uh, uh, peacenik geeks in California. So one of the things that Richard Feynman did as part of his career, very early on, is he went to work on the, the atomic bomb program at uh, Los Alamos, which is where all that research is being done. And there are a lot of famous stories about his time at Los Alamos. Uh, one of the great stories, uh, he was always trying to find where people were doing stupid things or missing obvious things. And so a famous story of his is that, of course, security was very tight at Los Alamos. And one day, he saw that there was a hole in the back fence. It was big enough for a person to get through. So he reported to the camp commander. And he went the next day, and it still wasn't fixed. And he went the next day, and it still wasn't fixed. So he thought to himself, how can I make sure they fix this? So what he did was, he crawled out the hole in the fence, walked around to the front gate, and walked in and said hi to the two security guards there. Hi, Bob. Hi, Steve. Walked straight to the hole, crawled out the hole again, walked back to the front gate, walked in. Hi, Bob. Hi, Steve. Walked out the hole again. The third time he came in the front gate, they said, okay, stop. You just entered three times without leaving once. How did you do that? And they said, well, there's a hole in the fence out back. Okay, we'll go fix that. He got the hole in the fence fixed. By applying his intellect to solve his problem. One of the other things he's very famous for as well, in fact, there are a bunch of anecdotes about this, is as a safe cracker, he convinced people that he could crack safes by feeling them and feeling the tumblers inside. Turns out that's not true. Because what he did was he got interested at one point in safe cracking, kind of randomly. So he did a, bit, a bunch of research and he found, great, much to his disappointment, that most of it is not technique, it's all social engineering. Most safe combinations are birthdays. And so he figured out using mathematics that there are like a thousand different possible date combinations on safe. So he, what he would do is sneak into someone's office late at night when they weren't there and try all the possible date combinations until he found the combination of their safe, then write it down, 
And then later he would walk into their office and just kind of casually go over to their safe and kind of put his hands on it and then open it and convince everyone that he was a safe cracker. When he wasn't, he was just really, really clever with his social engineering. This is a great example of this idea of pulling in ideas from every single discipline you touch and trying to incorporate them into your life story. Another great story of his from Los Alamos is the creation of the very first parallel computer. If you look at the dictionary prior to 1945, the word computer is there. It is a person who computes things. And they had computers at Los Alamos too. Large rooms primarily of women, because most of the men were at war, with adding machines and slide rules. And they were doing important calculations for the research that they were doing in Los Alamos. But it turned out, and Richard Fine was put in charge of this group for a while, and he figured out that some of the women were much better at the adding, subtracting, that kind of fundamental arithmetic stuff. Some of the women were much better at logarithms and even slide rules. And so rather than having each person go through all the computations, he created basically stages, a pipeline, where he said, you just do addition and you do subtraction. He basically created a parallel computer out of these as CPUs. And he invented some really clever ideas about what happens if somebody makes a mistake. You didn't have to restart the card all the way at the beginning. You could restart it from the mistake and go forward. They color-coded cards to manage the places where he installed a pipeline and come back. In fact, he ended up getting some uh, patents for parallel computing late in his career, even though he had nothing to do with computer science, but he figured out how parallel computing works with these computers in the 40s and then applied that to actual computers in the 70s and 80s. Here's another example of geek leaking into software. There's a terrific book out right now called The Power of Habit. And he brings up a really important point that is applicable to software products. They do an experiment, they sign an experiment in this book, where they take a rat and a maze, a very common scientific experiment, but what they do, they have a T-shaped maze, left and right, and they always put the food prize on the left-hand side. And so they set the rat loose, he walks the maze, it's a very easy maze, so he finds the food belt. And they wired the brain activity up for the rat to see what the rat's thinking about. So click is the opening of the gate, and he goes to the first section and the second section, and then he gets chocolate, which is a treat. This is his mental activity while he's doing this. But what they did was always put the treat on the left-hand branch. And so over time, the rat actually expended much less mental activity because it became a habit. It turns out there is a part of our brain that manages habits for us. And it's really powerful. This is why you can walk and talk at the same time. Because the habit part of your brain has taken over for that because you've done it so much. Any activity that you do a lot, the habit part of your brain takes over and the cognitive parts of your brain are freed up to do other things. This is important because having good development habits literally frees you up to do other things. If you have a really good habit about always checking in as soon as you finish a new feature. You don't have to think about that. It really becomes hardwired, and you now expend less cognitive ability thinking about that common thing you need to be doing and can spend more of that brain power thinking about something else that is closer to the problem you're trying to solve. This is a great example of psychology leaking into things like software development habits. Another kind of unexpected place where this geek leak idea comes from is the workshop I'm going to be doing the rest of the day today, which is this idea of continuous delivery. This is a great example of geek leaking in several different aspects. So let me talk about this. Now, one of the problems we have in the Agile world is what I'm calling the continuous continuum. We have too many things with the word continuous as part of their name. So I'm going to kind of fix that and, and pull these things apart. So the first one of these that we all know and love is this idea of continuous integration. And I've done uh, uh, the workshop, the continuous delivery workshop a few times with Martin Fowler, who's the chief scientist at ThoughtWorks, and he tells a great story at this point, which I'll relay on his behalf. It's about the very first software project he ever saw. He was a teenager. He grew up in Birmingham in the UK. And his father had a friend who was running a software project, 
And he gave Teenage Martin a chance to go see this software project. And it was in this big abandoned warehouse. Everybody was sitting around with mainframe terminals. And the guy who was giving them the tour said that everyone was currently working on integrating all their code. If they finished coding about six months ago. They were currently integrating all their code. And it had taken them longer than they thought. And they weren't sure when they were going to be finished. So Martin says he didn't know what integrating code meant, but he remembers leaving that meeting thinking, wow, that must be a really important part of the software development process. And all these professionals have been working on it six months. It's taken them longer than they thought, and they're not even sure when it's going to be done. It must be this really you know, powerful, nuanced, magical kind of process. It turns out it's a process. But there's nothing magical about it. If you look at software engineering texts from the 1960s and 70s, there is a specific integration phase in those projects. The idea being that people go off in isolation for weeks and months at a time. At the very end of the project, you try to get all that code to work together. And it was horrible. It was the worst thing ever. And it's not like people said, this is the strategic time to do that. It was more like, you know, this is a really hard problem. Let's just get what done we can get done, and we'll tackle that problem when we get to it. The problem, though, is that there are lots of problems in the software world that the longer you put it off, the worse it gets. And this is absolutely one of those problems that the longer you put it off, it gets worse and worse and worse. And the original extreme programming guys came up with this idea of continuous integration. This is the idea of integrate over and offer. The original rule on the XP project was that everybody must integrate all their code at least once a day. People on traditional projects said, are you crazy? Do you know how awful and painful integration is? And you want us to do that every single day? That's going to make every day on the project the worst day ever. It turns out that when you do it every day, it's not painful at all. In fact, not only is it not painful, it disappears. We don't even talk about integration as a phase in projects anymore because it is so disappeared because we do this on a more or less ongoing basis now because it's the only sane way to actually write software with large groups of people. We don't even think about this as a practice now. This is just uh, a mechanism on projects, and we've built all these tools to do this. Continuous integration servers like Cruise Control and Jenkins, Team City and Bamboo, etc. The practice is still important. But a lot of people took this idea of the machinery and said, Let's get really ambitious with this. We've got our continuous integration server running unit tests and running functional tests. We can do scalability tests, other things like that. We can build up a more and more sophisticated set of verification for our code. And you get to the point where you have so much confidence in that, you say, you know what? The last step is just deploy it. And that's this idea of continuous deployment. Deploy is the final stage of continuous integration. We have so much automated verification going on that we'll just push it live right away. A lot of companies do this. In fact, companies that are in extraordinarily competitive markets tend to do this because that gives them the fastest possible turnaround on features on their sites. There's a famous craft site in the US called Etsy that does continuous deployment. Every time a developer checks something in, if it goes through their gauntlet and makes it, it will show up on the website. In fact, at Etsy, you're not allowed to leave work on your first day until you have code running in production. So that's the trial by fire at Etsy, is you have to have pushed some code that made it all the way to production on your first day. Get used to this idea that when you check code in, it shows up on the website. But this, for most people, is more trouble than it's worse. Unless you're in a crazily aggressive kind of market, this is actually probably more detriment than benefit. But it has the seeds of a really great idea in it, which is this idea of continuous delivery, that software is always in a deployable state. It is like continuous deployment, except that you don't automatically pull the trigger to pull it live at the last step. Instead, you leave it sitting there so that a business person can decide, should this go live or not? We're trying to get the idea of liveness taken out of the hands of the IT group and put it in the hands of the business group. Because if every single check-in that you make yields deployable code, then it becomes a business decision of when do we actually want to deploy this set of features, not a constraint imposed by IT. 
For many, many years, those in the Agile community thought that we really focused a lot on this front end of development, getting analysis design and estimation right, and doing iterative development. I mean, many organizations code, when it left this phase, went into a very unagile place of centralized QA with integration plus QA with all the other non-agile projects and all those things having to work together, and eventually to operations where it goes into care and maintenance and feeding for the rest of its life. This is what we always traditionally call the last mile. And for many, many years, the agile community said, yeah, that's somebody else's problem. But we've really finally realized that if your goal is stability on running software, you can't ignore those places because those places are getting more and more complex all the time. And the idea of continuous delivery is instead of doing those as phases, let's do them all the time. This is exactly what we did with Waterfall on the front end of the project. We're doing this for the entire idea of deployment and quality for uh, enterprises now, this idea of this constant flow of new features in production, operationalized QA and operations so that they can fit into this feedback loop as well. The idea behind continuous delivery is this, this pipeline concept. So this is basically continuous integration, as you know and love it. When something happens, you pick up those changes, compile, test them, etc., and then take those compiled units and push them over to the file system. But the idea of continuous delivery is that you don't stop there. What you do is create a pipeline where you have these stages that it can go through. And CI is just the first stage of the pipeline. The second stage is going to be additional kinds of verification, like testing, for example, acceptance testing. But notice the first step of this new stage is called configure environment. What we would ideally like to do in a continuous delivery world is pull in from version control a puppet or chef script that describes the machinery that our application needs to run on and build it up programmatically and then install our code on it and then run tests on it. Take what used to be operations job and incorporate that into the development process itself and push that kind of machine provisioning further and further down toward the developers. Every subsequent stage now starts with this idea of let's programmatically configure the environment so that we know exactly what it's running on at all times. Now, this relies heavily on automation, of course, but this can accommodate manual stages. Continuous delivery does not require that you be a really mature agile shop. In fact, it doesn't require anything except that you have the potential to make all your stuff faster. So, but even for manual stages, we still have this configure environment stage. We still want to programmatically build up all the infrastructure, even if it's going to be several weeks of someone doing manual uh, exploratory testing or usability testing. We still want the same mechanism in place consistently through all those things, through all those uh, reasons. A lot of organizations end up looking like this. We have all these people involved in software projects but you have these barriers between these groups. Either soft or very hard barriers in some places. This is what we refer to as a company that is human resources optimized. Because your human resources department are the one who set these things up. And this makes really good sense for your human resources department because DBAs have a certain salary band that they fall into. There's a certain place you go to try to find DBAs. And you know there's a certain hiring practice for DBAs. So it makes it really nice to be able to put people in pockets like this. And for most of your company, this doesn't hurt anything. Because if the sales guys and the accounting guys are in different HR silos, nobody cares. But they don't pass this really intimate work product back and forth multiple times a day across those silos. What happens in a lot of organizations is that one of these groups gets overworked. Like operations, almost always is overworked. So what they do is say, well, to manage our work queue, we're going to put in a ticketing system. And that makes their work queue a lot better and destroys everybody else's. Because you rely on the assets that they control. This is dumb. What we're trying to do in the continuous delivery world is melt those things down and try to create feedback loops between these groups. This is a really serious case of geek leaking because what's happening here is your software development process is leaking all over your HR department. And they're not going to like it at all. 
Because they like the way things are set up right now, but it's not the best way to write software. And having those artificial barriers in place, the silos, really impedes your ability to do good software development. But this is a great example of the software development process actually leaking into more and more and more of the places of your organization. Because you really have to optimize at the organizational level if you're going to become efficient at something that crosses so many organizational boundaries like software development. But one of the things that you see talked a lot about in continuous delivery and the agile world is this idea of continuous improvement and feedback loops. In fact, you've probably seen this thing at some point. This is uh, W. Edwards Deming, the Deming cycle, which is plan, take your plan, act on it, do it. When you get, when it's done, check and get results from it and use those results to feed back into the next plan. So this is the mantra in Agile projects is to, as a way to keep continuous improvement. But those of us with a, a kind of a scientific bent are curious as to why this works so well. And it's actually quite obvious why this works so well, because this is really nothing more than the scientific method. Hypothesize, experiment, get results, take conclusions, and feed back into the next hypothesis. That's the real reason that a lot of these agile techniques and things like continuous delivery actually work. This is really fundamentally based on the scientific method of let's experiment and see what happens and use that to feed back into our results which is the only sane way to attack an empirical problem like software development. You've never solved this exact problem before, therefore the best way to do it is not try to plan it to death, but do a little bit of work, check it, and then use that to feedback into the next result. And of course, scientific method leads us right back to Richard Feynman. Here's a picture of him actually from Los Alamos cracking a safe. He is a famous safe cracking mode. I talked about earlier. Um, next thing I want to talk about is an idea that comes from this keynote. This is Rich Hickey, the guy who created Closure, and he did a great keynote at a conference called Strange Loop a couple of years ago called Simple Made Easy. Now, I strongly recommend it. It's a terrific keynote. It explains a lot of his design principles behind Closure. Um, and in particular, he introduced a term that I really like. Rich is a lover of words like I am. And he found this archaic term that fits so nicely with so many of our problems today. And the term he came up with describes braiding things together. <coughs> this is an example of how to braid things. And the term is complex. Something that is complected means that it is braided together. So the last figure here is something that is complected. Too much of our world is complected, it's braided together, separate things being braided together in, in bad ways. We would much rather live in this world where it's easy to tell what each of those strands is doing. Here you can't tell which is A, which is B, which is C because they're all complected together. So there are three examples that I want to show of complexity in our world. One from the presentation founder's book, one from architecture and design, and one in the way that closure handles identity. So the first one I'll talk about is the presentation patterns book. And the, the way this came about was one of the things that you use as you're trying to simplify something is trying to look for places where two things are confused and are wound together or collected together. And we actually discovered that, uh, what is the real difference? This is the, one of the key uh, ideas of the presentation pattern book. What is the difference, the fundamental difference, between presentation and prose? So you've got a choice here. You could write something in PowerPoint or you could write it in Word. You could write it as a memo or you could write it as a slide deck. What's the real fundamental difference between those two things? Time. When I'm doing a presentation, I control time. When you're reading a document, you control the time because you can read it faster, you can read it slower. When I'm doing a presentation, I control the time. I control exactly what rate things come out in. And so using that as a simplifying principle, we separated this idea of an info deck versus a presentation. 
both using tools like PowerPoint and Keynote, but very different outcomes. And the real difference that comes down here is the use of animations or transitions. An animation is movement or revelation within a slide, so that was just an animation I showed you. Transition is moving from one slide to another, so I'm about to show you a transition right here. This idea of an info deck is a really powerful idea because my colleague Martin Fowler has started building web-based info decks. Rather than writing traditional essays about this stuff, he's using the kind of building blocks for presentations, but this is never designed to be shown on a wall and displayed somewhere with someone standing in front of it. It is meant to be a way for you as a reader to go through it and almost like a slideshow, but very much as an information deck, not meant to be a presentation. So splitting those two concepts out now lets you think about, well, info deck is a perfectly reasonable communication medium all by itself, and presentation is another kind of medium. Another place that this falls out in the presentation patterns book is the difference between a demonstration versus a presentation. And you see these in technical demonstrations a lot, and we also call out what we call live demos versus dead demos. Vincat gave a great example of a live demo in his last talk. We did some live coding and showed how pieces fit together. You know, Vincat's very good at that, but he got a syntax error. He didn't have to stop and think about it. He kept talking and fixed the syntax error, and then it went right along. That's a really hard one skill, um, and very few people do that kind of live coding really well. Um, but you don't have to do that to be able to show compelling things in a technical presentation. And in fact, we give several alternatives to that, uh, what we call these de demo kind of presentations. Here's an example of a technique that we call traveling highlights, where we still have code on the screen, but you'll notice a highlight is traveling between, it's kind of faint to see there, highlight is traveling between the code that I want to talk about, each one in turn. There's another trick that we use uh, for opacity. It'll be hard to see here because the uh, contrast is not great, but you can see that's highlighted when we're talking about that particular code. This is one where we actually fade out the code that we don't care about and just talk about the code that we do care about by shifting the opacity of that code. By not showing code in an editor and showing it on a slide, you can also do some really nice presentation tricks. So here's a slide from one of my other talks. Well, I'm really trying to bring home the point of how much duplication there is between these two comparators. Well, I'm in a presentation tool so I can demonstrate exactly how much the duplication there is just by overlaying them on top of one another. You can't do that in a coding editor, but you can in a presentation tool. The other thing that drives us crazy is watching someone interact live with a tool that requires a lot of setup and teardown time. So this is from uh, one of my co-authors, one of his talks on debugging in Java. He has to start up a debugger in Eclipse, and he has to have servers running, and all this other stuff has to be up and running before things can work. Rather than doing this live in front of the crowd, because if you do this, you're guaranteed that your internet connection is not going to work, or something's going to break, why not just record it? This is a pattern that we call lip sync. Record this as a video and embed it in your presentation now, as I'm talking about this, I don't have to concentrate on making all this stuff work. I can describe what it's doing. I can give extra insight what's going on there. I can talk about exceptional conditions because my concentration is not all completely tied up in making these things work and talking about what they're doing. The other nice thing about this is that for this particular presentation, it used to take 19 minutes and 30 seconds for him to run through his entire demo to show all this stuff. Once he lip synced it all and actually got rid of the boring parts about servers starting up and all that junk that you see every day that you don't want to see as part of a presentation, that part of his presentation became a minute and 30 seconds, which means that he now has 17 extra minutes that he can add more material to his presentation for because he wasn't spending 17 minutes of doing useless setup for things that people didn't really care about. So this allows you to get much higher information density without swapping out between two tools and, uh, uh, and interacting with them live. But one of the anti-patterns that we call out in our book is going meta, which is talking about the presentation during the presentation, and I'm getting very dangerously close to doing that. So I'll leave the presentation patterns topic for now and talk about another example of complexity. In fact, this example is the one from closure itself. Now, the idea of today, the, the Gibbs Edge idea, are these keynotes about cutting edge ideas. 
It's not that surprising that both Vincat and I are going to talk about software transactional memory and closure. That's a really cool thing. But I'm actually going to show you a little more of the motivation behind that. One of the things that Rich Hickey did was figure out what makes threading so hard in Java. It's actually an example of complexity that makes threading so hard in Java. Because when the idea of variables was created in Java, they created that concept long before they created the concept of thread. And they led a bunch of assumptions about how variables work that threads invalidate. But because variables were so fundamental to the design of Java, they couldn't go back and change variables once they introduced threads. They had to introduce things like synchronized blocks and things that make threading so hard. What Rich Hickey did was figure out that this is really a problem of complexity. The problem is we have three things complected together on top of this concept of variable in Java. We have the identity of the thing, and we also have its value. And those two things together are its state at some point in time. And almost always in computer science, when you have one mechanism handling two completely different jobs, you've got a problem. And that's exactly manifest in Java for how hard concurrency is. And so that's the way he fixed this enclosure. He decomplected, he simplified this weaving together and separated this idea of mutability and this idea of reference and value. And so in the closure world, identity is a unique thing, and it never changes over time, but an identity may point to some new value at some point in time. What closure did with software transactional memory is say, let me control that. If you'll let me control that, I'll guarantee thread safety. This is what Vincat was showing with refs and deref's. It's the only kind of mutable thing, and the only way you can move this arrow from here to here is inside a transaction, inside collision. That's his unique take on this. And that's how he fixed this problem in closure. So this can be thought of as a single reference, this, this dotted box. And over time, it takes on several different values. Uh, always by applying a pure function to mutate it, to change it from one state to another state. At some point in time, some observer is going to come along and capture its state and say, this is what its state is at a particular point in time. That's what state is. That's what observers and perception and that memory give you. And this is all done, of course, with pure functions. And this is diagrammatically what Vincat was talking about before, this idea of software transactional memory. Because closure has taken over that mutation step and controls it as managed uh, concurrency, then you can actually have multiple variables in Java all get mutated or none get mutated. In fact, the software transactional memory of closure is ACI but not D. It's atomic, consistent, and isolated, but it's not durable because it's software transactional memory. But it still gives you the other three things that you're used to from transactions at the variable level. So you can say in closure, these three variables all get mutated or none of them get mutated, which is very hard to do otherwise, particularly in that thread set class. We've already seen the syntax for this, so I won't spend much time on it. It's actually quite simple. You create a reference to something that is something that is going to be mutable. Now if you want to update this message that I've created, I can write this code that says, uh, this is a function that says add message, give this message, and this says alter messages can join this new message onto the end of it. But notice do sync. This code won't run without that do sync there because I'm mutating something that is mutable in the closure world, and you must do that inside software transaction memory. This is a very sophisticated mechanism. In fact, not the only way to do thread safe concurrent things in uh, closure. There are atoms and other sorts of building blocks for this kind of stuff, but it shows some really advanced capabilities built around. Basically, this idea of uncomplecting, of simplifying this complexing of state and identity and value in variables in Java way back in the early 90s when it was created. The last aspect of this I'm going to talk about is architectural. I'm going to do a talk later this week called Emergent Design. And in it, I talk about this distinction between design and architecture. There's a terrific white paper that Martin Fowler released about, I think, six or seven years ago now called Who Needs an Architect? Uh, this is a white paper that's available on his website. And in it, he talks about the role of architects on agile projects. And he gives what is my favorite definition of architecture in software. I uh, still haven't found one better. 
He says the architectural elements in software are the things that are hard to change later. I think that's a really good definition because you can ask part of your software stack, are you going to be hard to change later? And if the answer is yes, then it's architectural. So your database, your language, your web framework are all architectural because it's going to be hard to change those later. But the way you use your web framework, the way you use its validation bits, the way you use its workflow bits, those are all aspects of design. And this very abstract picture actually captures that because I make this distinction between evolutionary architecture and emergent design. Because think about these boxes. If, these are, if the gray boxes are architectural elements, I can't just pull these out because the whole thing gets unstable. Whereas the design boxes, I can shuffle them around without having much impact. So the idea of evolutionary architecture and emergent design is you can actually start with virtually no design and let it emerge over time, but you have to have architecture in place because everything else sits on your architecture. But the goal should be, let's make that architecture as simple as possible. We want as few things that are hard to change later as possible. And that's really this idea of evolution architecture and emergent design is trying to identify those things because architectural elements provide scaffolding and convenience, but they also create constraints. If you want the most benefit with the least constraints, that's really the goal that you're after here. When you start thinking about architectural things and things that are complected in the architectural world, what about this? Trying to do create, read, update, and delete operations against traditional relational databases is hard. That's why we have all these things like Hibernate and Ibatics and OR mappers and all this stuff to manage this complexity that we have here. This is really because of complexity. Because we're trying to read and write at the same time. And that's hard to do. And so you have to build a lot of mechanisms to allow that to happen. Versus something like CQRX, which is a different architectural style that says, let's query from one and then write to the other. This means that one of them only queries and the other one only writes. And the architecture is much simpler here because you don't have to worry about conflicts and other sorts of things. Now, you do have to embrace eventual consistency here. You can't do this in transactions. But you know what? Banks don't do this in transactions. Banks existed before computers existed. And used to, people did financial tra uh, for transactions on horseback. There is no two-phase commit if a horse is involved. Banks don't do two-phase commit either. And so most people do eventual consistency, and that's exactly what this model says. If you can do that, it simplifies all the things in the rest of your architecture because you haven't complected those really hard things together like you did before. So obviously Richard Feynman is a famous guy, Nobel Prize winner. There's a U.S. stamp based on Richard Feynman. In his later life, he became a famous guy as a physicist and well-known uh, uh, author and a drummer, and also a drummer. And he was generally a very happy guy. Uh, he's really well known, in fact, for being very go uh, happy go lucky and uh, very, uh, very uh, easy going. But he also worked on one of the most devastating things of the century. Now, most of the things I've been talking about up until now have talked about deep leaking as purely a good thing. That's not always the case. There can be a dark side to this as well. Things like overly clever solutions. At about the time that financial crisis hit, there was a huge upsurge in mobile development and other sorts of development. And one of my colleagues believes that the really smart people who used to go to Wall Street are now into software development. And this gets back to that idea that every company is now a software company. That is becoming a core competency now. So I think a lot of these guys have stopped trying to destroy the financial markets and are now trying to destroy the mobile market. This is a bit of a trend that is starting to die down a bit in the U.S., but it's really obnoxious. This thing uh, called programmers, which is kind of programming as a fraternity activity. Uh, a lot of uh, really obnoxious stuff about, you know, only guys should be able to write software and a bunch of stupid things like that. In fact, it's, it's beyond stupid. It's actually not scientifically accurate. Because there's some really interesting studies, Harvard Business Review just did a study that showed that the collective intelligence of a group of people is higher if you have women as part of that group. 
If you look at the collective intelligence, not the individual intelligence, but the collective intelligence of the group, the presence of women drives that much higher in a significant way. And it's not that specifically women are smarter than men, it's because they have much better social sensitivity, and adding that to a large group dynamic always makes that dynamic better and makes the people in that group work better. So you actually should embrace diversity on your projects. Don't try to chase it away. That's a terrible idea and a really bad aspect of geek Here's another example. Now, the very first time I did this keynote was at DevOps in uh, Belgium. And the guys right before me were showing off Java-powered robots. So here are Java-powered robots. It's, I'm taking this with my phone camera, so it's a little bit hard to see. You can actually program these robots to dance using Java. You can see them down here, and that's the big screen that these guys are there. You can see these guys start dancing here in a second. Yeah, okay. Sometimes you like Java code, so good. This is an example of reclaiming from the robotics world to the software world. So that got me interested. Wow, what's been happening in the robotics world? That's pretty cool. I started looking, and it scared me to death. You can't believe what they're doing with robot technology now. This is a military robot. It looks like a dog that follows you and has supplies and stuff like that. Dolphin now has a robot that can run an optical course that humans have a hard time running. They now have these robots that can scale walls and stuff like that. I started thinking. They say that before long, we will have artificial intelligences of the intelligence of a cockroach. So you're telling me that before long, we're going to have to start worrying about an armed cockroach cyborg coming after me? <laughs> And I really worry about the metaphorical bugs inside this real bug. And I worry a little bit that we're going a little too fast on this whole robotics thing. Maybe faster than we should have. Now, fortunately, someone has provided a solution for this. Isaac Asimov, a very famous mutton chop enthusiast and science fiction writer, wrote a book called iRobot. And in it, he talks about the three laws of robotics that will keep us safe as mankind. So we're supposed to codify these into robots. This idea that a robot can't injure a human or through an action allow them to go to harm, and they must obey orders, and it can predict its own existence as long as it doesn't conflict with the other laws. And these all sound really fine and good. Here's the problem. You guys know what Roombas are, right? Do you know how to code those three laws into a Roomba? I know. A Roomba's already got some robotics in it, and I don't know that we can code those laws into it. In fact, my big fear is that any robot intelligent enough to understand those three laws is also intelligent enough to ignore those three laws. <laughs> now, for now, it looks like dogs have our back in the battle against robots. So that's good. Dogs are helping to defend us against the robot horde. We really have to start worrying we're in deep trouble when the robots and the cats team up. <laughs> then we're going to be on our own. We may be building something more dangerous than we can control. And we do this all the time in technology. Fortunately, we have a really good reference to when this has happened before from Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was present when they detonated the very first atomic weapons. And when he saw that, he was kind of appalled. Because by that time, the war in Europe was over, and the war in Japan was kind of winding down. He made an interesting observation. This is a direct quote from Mr. Feynman. He says, with any project like that, you continue to work trying to get success, having decided to do it. But what I did, immorally, I would say, was to not remember the reason I said I was doing it. So that when the reason changed, not the singlest thought came into my mind that meant now I have to reconsider why I'm continuing to do this. When they started working on the atomic bomb project, there was a clear need for that. It was a dire worldwide crisis. But by the time they got it finished, the crisis was largely abated, but they were all geeked into the problem of can we get this thing to work? And they finally got it to work, and they realized what they had created and most of them suffered mentally for the rest of their lives from having been involved in creating that. Realize that somebody has to build the software 
for robots that will eventually start killing people. You are never completely abstracted away from the things that you build. Even in the software world, where it seems like we're really abstracted away, you need to really consider what is the end use for this going to be, and is this something that I support as a person? The military always find, tries to find ways to apply deep leakage. The last chapter in Feynman's career is also another great example of deep leakage. And this had to do with the uh, space shuttle uh, disaster. In fact, I'm going to talk about a tale of two space shuttles here. And the first one is the Columbia. The Columbia space shuttle, when it took off, if you don't recall, some of the foam insulation broke off of the tank and hit the wing of the space shuttle. I'm uh, sorry, this is the different, I'm sorry, I'm, I've got my two uh, disasters mixed up. Uh, this is the one, sorry, this is the Challenger. This is one where the O-rings, the, the, uh, they blew up on takeoff. Uh, and they think it was the rings, these O-rings inside the chemical booster rockets here, because it was very cold on that day that they took off, and they believe that the rubber contracted. That was the big argument as to what had actually happened. So they put together this panel of scientists, Richard Feynman was the only actual scientist there. They had like politicians, Neil Armstrong, the former astronaut, was there. And they, all these engineers took them around to all these places and were showing them all these things about O-rings and how those work. And Feynman was skeptical about what all these engineers were telling him. So notice he had a picture of ice water in front of him. He got some of that O-ring material and put it under a clamp and dropped it in his glass of ice water. And when it came time for him to talk, he pulled it out and demonstrated that it was stiff when it got cold, which just completely destroyed the argument of all these engineers coming before him. In fact, I'll let it say that. Well, I took this stuff that I got out of the Rosina, and I put it in ice water. And I discovered that when you put some pressure on it for a while and then undo it, it doesn't stretch back. It stays the same dimension. In other words, for a few seconds at least, and more seconds than that, there's no resilience in this particular material when it's at a temperature of 32 degrees. I believe that has some significance. So that's why we're talking about what really happened, the core, the real essence of the problem, not all this noise that these engineers were making, he got down to the very essence of the problem. So to summarize, try to embrace the scientific method no matter what you do. There's real value here, this idea of experimentation, this idea of uh, creating empirical ideas behind things. Try as much as you can. Somebody actually suggested this term, decomplect. That's a terrible, terrible term. The opposite of complex is simplify. Try to unbraid the things that are braided together in your project, and very often you'll find a much cleverer solution to those problems. Thoughts aren't always really neat and organized as much as they'd like them to be. So uh, a lot you want to allow leakage from other disciplines to come into your discipline and apply those with some uh, objectivity to see can this actually help my process and don't just discount it because it comes from a field like sociology or psychology or something else like that. And so last I would say is to allow geek to leap across disciplines to help you find more thought and innovation on your product. Thanks very much. It looks like I'm a little over time. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. I'm here for the rest of the week. Thanks very much.